Hello everyone, welcome back to Brombird News. We've got a couple of things for you on backyard feeding. Joe Robleski from Montreal took a picture of a song sparrow and realized that it was banded. Did you know that every year scientists band over 1 million birds, you know, to track their movements and their populations, but unfortunately only 1% of those birds gets recorded. So if you ever find or see a bird with a band, either live or dead, please record your sighting on the website that was specifically done for North America. It's called reportband.gov. Just please make sure not to try and capture the bird or remove the band. And now let's talk about dandelions. What do you think about them? We're not too bothered by them, though we do know that they're not native here, so we kind of control how many of them will let grow on our property. And a few days ago, we witnessed another reason why we let some of them grow in our backyard. Goldfinches are dependent on flowers that produce all sorts of fluff. The compositive family of flowers uh, that are native to here are the best, you know, like zinnias, cone flowers, black eyed Susans, marigolds, and thistle. The problem with those flowers is that they only start producing things much later in the season, whereas dandelions don't. Goldfinches absolutely love eating dandelion seeds, and I'll show you where they are on the flower. So if you pluck the fluff right here, and then at the bottom you see this dark part, that's the seeds that goldfinches and actually other birds love to eat them as well. And then the fluff here, goldfinches and other birds, even the hummingbirds, they pluck this to either build their nest or to line their nest with this kind of fluff. So if you can, please let some of the dandelions grow on your property. Every weekday morning, Carol from our customer care and I drop our kids off at school and then we walk our dogs together and we see a rather substantial committee of turkey vultures that hang out in the same tree over and over. So we always wonder what they're up to. Hi Tatiana, thanks for sending me your video of those turkey vultures perched in the trees in your neighborhood. As to why they're there and what they're doing, there are two possibilities, both related. It all depends on the time of day and whether this is a daily routine. If it's just a one-off observation, it could be that there's some food nearby in the form of a roadkill. But if you're seeing them in the same location on several or more occasions, particularly in the early evening and or mid-morning, you are looking at a favored night roost site. You see, three or four decades ago, seeing turkey vultures in towns and cities was a rarity. But today they are much more common in these habitats. They now regularly soar right over the skyscrapers of large cities like Montreal all summer long. I see them quite commonly in my suburban area in British Columbia nine months of the year. These roosts can vary in size from a dozen or so birds up to 4,000, but more often they contain about 100 to 300 individuals. A typical day begins with turkey vultures staying at the roost, sunning themselves for thermoregulation until about one to five hours past sunrise after which they all leave to patrol the area for carrion. The bad news is that these roosts are sometimes located in small towns where the birds can become quite a nuisance, at least to some people. In parts of the southern U.S., ranging from Florida to Virginia, roosting flocks of turkey vultures have been culled or killed by wildlife managers because they cause damage to human structures. They peck and claw at construction surfaces such as roof shingles, defecate and regurgitate on children's playground equipment and boat covers. One flock of turkey vultures notably desecrated the cemetery by tearing off garlands and ribbons from gravestones. To my mind though, we need to find more non-destructive ways to disperse these highly useful feathered sanitary engineers, which also serve to make our environment more interesting. Killing them for engaging in a bit of bad behavior seems a bit excessive. Hey there. Want to know what your local wild condors have been eating over the last 2,000 years? Just check out their poop. That's exactly what a team of scientists headed by a Queen's University student did for a recently published study. They learned some surprising things. First, they wanted to know how ongoing climate change might affect our wildlife by examining how some species have adapted to past periods of climate warming. They chose a particularly accessible nest in Patagonia, Argentina, which had been used by Andean condors for thousands of years, accumulating a deep pile of guano about 10 feet wide. 
They cut out a 10 inch deep piece of poopy pie and took it to the laboratory for carbon dating and various other analyses, including their dietary changes over 2,000 years. They found that as humans introduced livestock to the area, the birds switched to feeding on sheep and cattle from a previous diet of dead whales, alpacas and llamas. Second, they also discovered that the condors abandoned that particular nest site for a thousand year period, likely due to volcanic activity blanking the vegetation in the immediate region with ash and forcing the birds to forage elsewhere. The dietary change was especially interesting because the switch to livestock meant that the condors were also ingesting lead shot in vermin killed by the farmers protecting their livestock. And that is a serious ongoing problem that still affects all wild condors to this day. Do you know which family brown threshers belong to? The Mimidi family, grey catbirds and northern mockingbirds belong to the same family. And these birds are famous for their ability to mimic all sorts of sounds and songs. They are beautiful singers. Here's a brown thresher song. Both sexes look the same. They are found throughout the year in southeastern states and then they move all the way up here for their breeding season. Susan Rock here from Florida always sends me pictures and videos of her brown threshers in the winter when it's so cold here and I always miss my brown threshers. They love to forage and hang out in these overgrown areas, you know, tall grass and thickets and hedges and bushes. And since we leave a rather substantial part of our property wild and overgrown, they have become regular visitors here and every spring we look forward to their return. Their diet is mostly insects, some berries and nuts. And ever since I put up my uh, Squirrel Buster suet feeder and I fill it with my peanut suet, they have been visiting our feeders on a regular basis. They will even fight off starlings and grackles to get a piece of suet. And last summer, before they migrated south, they brought their young and showed them how the whole thing worked. It was so adorable to watch them. Another thing that they love on our property is blackberries and blueberries, which we actually grow for birds and we share them with everyone. And then if you don't have any of that available, water is always popular for them. They love bathing, especially when it's super hot outside. Brown thrushes are monogamous during their breeding season. The formed pairs work as a team. They build their nests together, they incubate, and they both feed their chicks. And they have one to two broods depending on where they are. My son Kieran wanted to be on the show, so he's going to be announcing our July photo contest theme. But first, let's check out the top five of our June We Are Family photo contest. He is the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everyone. That was so much cuteness, wasn't it? Yeah. Really. All right, so Kieran, what holidays are there in July? Canada Day and Independence Day. So, what's our theme in July? Red, white, and blue. Good luck, everyone. Poof, things are getting a bit hot here. Time to go inside and drink some water. I hope you let some dandelions grow on your property. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.